In the name of Jesus, treasured brothers and sisters of the Our Savior's Lutheran Church family. Well, how's the Reformation going along? In our church, in our country. Is the greatest existential threat to our country climate change? Is it Islamic terrorism? Is it inflation? Is it resurgent COVID viruses? Is it Russia? Is it Iran? China? It's none of these. The greatest existential threat to our country is the battle for the soul of our nation. Because righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. And our nation has been abandoning righteousness for decades. The nose of the secular wolf camel has entered our tent. First, it was eliminating Christian instruction in our schools. Then, in 86, it was a reduction of the Lord's Day. Next came waffling on the right to life of babies in the womb. Next, our Supreme Court approved homosexual liaisons, and then they approved public group sexual activity as a Canadian value. Then the elite confuse male and female. Those smarter than anyone else rule. You have to let these secret men into women's sports and change rooms and bathrooms and prisons when we know that's just not fair, it's lewd, and has been proven to be dangerous. They forgot that Jesus said, have you not heard? In the beginning, he made them male and female. Then the snowballing right to die movement came. And now, just before Remembrance Day, our Canadian chaplains are told they can't pray in the name of God or our Heavenly Father. And some chaplains are leaving the force. Righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is a reproach to any people. And as Canadians, we are reproached. There's a battle going on for the soul of Canada, and anyone can see it. The psalmist asks our question, if the foundation is destroyed, what can the righteous do? And Jeremiah answers, ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the old ways where the good way is and walk in it. And from over 500 years ago, along comes Martin Luther and Reformation Day that eventually renewed the German language through the translation of the Bible, renewed communication and knowledge through the fledgling printing industry and renewed the church throughout the world and renewed the German nation. Our committee said, give me a place to stand and I will move the earth. And Luther said of the Bible, here I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. So on this Reformation Sunday, we have a duty to lay before the nation the cry, reclaim the word of God, and 
it is light. And may the Spirit of God lay this plea on our hearts and the hearts of the nation. Peter starts out, and we have the more sure prophetic word that we stop right in our tracks. And we retrace the verses before this claim to find out what the prophetic word is more sure than. And Peter, Peter, the leader of the disciples, the one known for his boldness, one of the disciples who had chosen to be in the inner circle of three with James and John, who was in the room when Jesus said to leave the Kumai and the daughter of Jairus was brought back to life, who was with the disciples when Thomas on Easter Eve touched the wounds of the risen Savior and confessed, my Lord and my God, one week after his resurrection. This Peter ransacks his life and he comes up with the one experience beyond any other experience and he writes, we were eyewitnesses of Christ's majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, we heard this voice born from heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain. Peter was an eyewitness of the transfiguration. He saw it. He heard the voice. He was with Christ, three of his senses he mentions here. Here was an experience to top all experiences. But he goes right on to say, but we have the more sure prophetic word. In other words, the word of God is more sure than any tremendous mountaintop experience. Perhaps in the back of Peter's mind were the words he once heard Christ say, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The word of God is more sure than experience. How often we covet the religious experience? We say, you know, if the Lord would give me a clear sign or a vision. If I could just hear his voice directing me, I would be sure. Or if we had some over-the-top escapade, you know, like a Blue Jays win in the World Series, or a Toronto Maple Leaf Stanley Cup. Or maybe we think, well, I don't feel much like a Christian. And we look to other Christian or non-Christian neighbors and we hear of their religious experience and we hear about their dreams and their visions and we think, well, what are my experiences compared to his or her? But a man with more experience and experiments with different religions than anyone else in our age can be Mahatma Gandhi. Still in his autobiography, he writes, it is an unbroken torch to me that I am still so far from him who, as I fully know, governs every breath of my life. I know that it is the evil passions within me that still keep me so far from him, and yet I cannot get away from them. Well, here is a perplexed cry from a tortured soul. We can properly wonder if he had confidence through the experiences of all the different religious traditions that he experimented with. Walking on the outskirts of a village, young Martin Luther was struck by a bolt of lightning, and he heard, was hurled to the ground, and in terror he cried out, saying, Anne, help me, I will become a monk. But later in life, he renounced the vow made after this experience, and instead, he staked everything on the prophetic word which was to him more sure. And on that, he stood firmly. Treasured friends in Christ, if the religious experience or the vision or the emotional feeling or moment of truth is not part of your life, you have no need to apologize. 
Feelings and experiences are like a caboose on the train of life. God's word is the engine. Long ago, Jeremiah gave his wise counsel. Let him who has a vision tell the vision. But let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. For what has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord. So the vision is the chaff. God's word is the wheat. His word is more sure than any experience. Our faith rests on scripture alone, nothing else. Sola scriptura, not sola experientia. Secondly, Peter catches our attention again when he tells us it's important to understand that no prophecy of scripture is of one's own interpretation. Now many people have sat down and thought about life and death and about good and evil and where the world has come from and where it's going and they have picked up pens and they have written their own interpretations of it all using various heroes and villains and gods and goddesses. These interpretations are called myths. There are volumes of religious myths throughout the world. Bhagavan Yasa, said to be the author of the myth of the Mahabharata, a Hindu scripture, is reported to have said to Brahma before writing his epic, he says, Lord, I have conceived an excellent work. I have conceived an excellent work. Well, there is a radical difference between myths like this and the prophetic word of the Bible. The Old and New Testament are not man's mythological thinking, his pious imagination, because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. They're not cleverly devised myths because holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The dominant impulse came from the Holy Spirit. A man like greedy Balaam of old, who was hired to curse the Israelites, was actually moved by the Holy Spirit to speak contrary to his will. He confessed, the word that God puts in my mouth, that I must speak. And at the other end of the scale is a man like Luke, a doctor and an accurate historian who willingly studied the written accounts of Jesus and checked the stories of eyewitnesses before writing an orderly account of the good news of Christ. In any case, the driving impulse behind all the prophetic word is the Holy Spirit. Now, not only the thoughts, but the very words in the original are inspired by the Spirit. Verse after verse testifies to this truth. In the Old Testament, repeated again and again, are the phrases, thus saith the Lord. And again, the word of the Lord came to, and Matthew writes over and over, as the Lord spoke through the prophets. And Paul said, we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. Now the result of it all is that the breath of the Holy Spirit moved over 40 different men over a period of 1600 years to write 66 books in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, which have one worldview, one doctrinal viewpoint, one moral standard, one plan of salvation centering on the one figure of Jesus the Christ. Now this amazing unity has come only through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit through this entire time and this entire process. On this word alone, we can't stand without any kind of shame or any kind of embarrassment. Ask the Hindu about 
certain of his customs based on mythology. And tragically, you will hear, as I have heard, if a man is honest, he will see an embarrassed smile come over his face and he will say, well, after all, it's only a story. Well, thank God we aren't caught living a false life based on stories or myths. Rather, we have the master blueprint from the one who invented and gives life, and every line and every stroke of the scriptures is true to life, and it's wrapped up in the warp and woof of history. Heaven and earth will pass away, said Jesus, but my word will not pass away. So, let's use it. Muslims call us Christians people of the book. But only one in seven Lutherans in Ontario is looking at the Bible weekly. That is not the way for people of the book to be squandering their heritage. I, for one, want to make a good confession in this generation, and I believe you do too. And we can do it quietly and confidently, without embarrassment, as we are rooted in the inspired word of God. Now, Peter gives us one more reason to reclaim the word. He says, you will do well to pay attention to this prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Now, the age in which Luther was born was labeled the Dark Ages. There was <coughs> misery. Peasants were abused by landowners. Bubonic plague was stalking the car. There was ignorance, books were scarce, expensive, and men were unlearned even in the scriptures, and perhaps the label applied. If a person from Luther's day were to hear about the advances in science and in technology and in medicine and literacy of the day, he would exclaim, whoa, surely you are living in an enlightened age, your future looks very bright indeed. Yet in Canada, we eliminate almost 100,000 new Canadian citizens every year by gruesome medical procedures in abortionaries. We allow child mutilation if they are gender confused. Full-term infanticide takes place. Misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda is found in our mainstream media. Globalist thinking counters Canadian rights. Marxist critical thought infects our educational system. And at first teachers were indoctrinated with queer theory, and now it's DEI, diversity and equity and inclusion. As reverse racism takes over and people are judged by the color of their skin rather than by their character. And reading, writing, and arithmetic take a rear seat. Psychic services is a $2 billion industry in America, and they sell pagan and occult paraphernalia and tarot cards, Ouija boards, skull bracelets, and daggers. And an estimated 2,000 fake messiahs are loose in North America. COVID 19 continues. Its relentless inroads and mask mandates are rising up again. Loneliness is experienced by 25% of the population. Drug poisoning, fentanyl deaths, suicides are rising. ESG, environmental social governance is throttling our business community. Science has been hampered by ideology and Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Federation says in the future we will own nothing and we will be happy and we will eat bugs. If we ever needed light, we need it now. And we, in our own ways, are bound up in this whole mess of darkness and sin that we find in our society today. How timely it is that Peter advises us, you will do well to pay attention to this prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place. In a period of religious confusion and moral degeneration, degradation, 
we can turn to God's law and we can find light for the road. But there's yet a brighter light in the scripture. And it is a person. He was the only one ever born who was not pure darkness, but pure light. He was come to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. This person confessed, I am the light of the world. And when he hung on the cross on Golgotha, the darkness of the whole world's sin was focused in on him. And somewhere in that gloom were our doubts and our fears and our desires for religious experiences and proofs, all of our atrocities and rebellion against God that is in the hearts and staining Canadian society. And we know that whoever keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point, he is guilty of all. So somehow we are tied up in this whole mess of darkness. But with the blaze of glory, all of this was driven away when Christ conquered death early Sunday morning. And of this we are sure, for the Spirit has spoken to our hearts in his word. Son and daughter, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven. Come out of the darkness into the light. Send out the light of the truth. Let them lead us to your holy hill. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Who shall I fear? At the beginning of the Reformation, Martin of Basel was afraid to make a public confession of his faith. Instead, he wrote on a leaf of parchment the words, O most merciful Christ, I know that I can be saved only by the merits of your blood. Holy Jesus, I acknowledge your suffering for me. I love you. I love you. And then he took the stone out of the wall. And he hid that parcel in behind that stone in his room. And it was hidden for a hundred years. But at the same time, Martin Luther learned that he was justified by faith in Christ. And he said, my Lord has confessed me before men. I will not shrink from confessing him before kings. And confess he did. And confess we must. And on this Reformation Sunday, if we want a place to stand, if we want to restore the foundations of our nation, and remove the reproach, we need to reclaim the word of God. It is more sure than any experience. It is the only word that is written, that is inspired by God, and it is light in this dark age. So, brothers and sisters in Christ. There is a happy job of confessing Christ going on in world history. And if it has slowed down in our generation, let's reclaim the word and get on with the task. Amen.